In this video, I'm going to talk about passive transport, one of the ways that things can get in and out of cells. So let's talk about what passive transport is in general, and then we'll get to some examples. First of all, in order to transport things in and out of cells using passive transport, there's no energy needed whatsoever. So remember when you did your simulation on the computer and you saw that the blue and orange molecules were bouncing around on their own? It's because they already have a type of energy within them that causes all molecules to move, whether it's a solid, a liquid, or a gas. So it's not like we need to heat up a solution or add some energy in some other way. Those molecules are naturally moving on their own. So because of that requirement of no energy needed, it's called passive transport. If a person is passive, they're very laid back, uh, easygoing, so no energy, in other words, in that person, just like no energy needed for passive transport. What is required, though, for the transport to happen is a concentration gradient, and that simply means a difference in concentration from one area to the next. So, for example, if I had a whole bunch of molecules over here, in this area and not very many molecules over here in this area I have what's called a concentration gradient. You've experienced this in your life for example if someone is making cookies in the kitchen and you can uh, smell the strong smell of cookies baking in the kitchen so the concentration gradient in the kitchen right here or the, sorry, the concentration of the molecules in the kitchen right there is stronger than the concentration of the molecules maybe in another room. So we call that a concentration gradient. It just means a difference in the concentration. This then causes the molecules to move, and this is where the transport comes in. Molecules will always move along their concentration gradient from the high to low direction. So eventually, over time, these molecules are going to start moving this way because remember they're all vibrating and shaking and bouncing off each other. So they're eventually going to move into that direction to where there's less of them. When they're all done moving, we have what's called an equilibrium, where the number of molecules of the cookie smell in the kitchen are the same as the number of molecules everywhere else. And they might still move back and forth a little bit, but they pretty much stay even. So again, the highlights of passive transport is that it doesn't require energy, the molecules are already moving, it does need a concentration gradient, in other words, a difference in concentration of molecules, and so then the molecules will always move from high to low concentration. Okay, now we're going to get into the examples of passive transport. There will be three examples, and diffusion is the first of these. Diffusion is a very general term for movement of molecules from high to low concentration. And the example that I just gave you with the smell of the chocolate chip cookies is an example of diffusion. So the cookie smell moved from high concentration in the kitchen to low concentration in another room until it was evenly spread out in equilibrium. Um, again, we call this moving with the concentration gradient from high to low. This happens in cells as well. So if I have a cell that, for example, has some small uncharged molecules like oxygen gas, and let's say those molecules are outside of the cell in higher numbers than they are inside of the cell, so now we have a concentration gradient because there are more oxygen molecules outside the cell than inside the cell, they're going to move from high to low concentration. In this case, they're going to begin to move into the cell. Now remember, they move until they are in an equilibrium. In this case, equilibrium would be four molecules inside the cell and four molecules outside the cell. Again, they can continue to move in and out of the cell, but they're going to stay pretty even unless a concentration gradient builds up again for some reason. The second type of passive transport is called facilitated diffusion. So it's still diffusion, molecules moving from high to low concentration, no energy required, but this time there are protein channels in the membrane of the cell 
that actually help those molecules to move because these molecules are usually large molecules or charged molecules. It's still moving with the concentration gradient from high to low concentration. So let's show an example of this one. So if this is my cell and I've got a bunch of glucose on the outside of the cell, let's say you just had a big meal. Glucose is a type of sugar. You've got a lot of it outside your cells, only a little bit inside the cell. The cell wants to bring that glucose in. But glucose is a pretty big molecule. It can't just wiggle through the phospholipids of the cell membrane like oxygen could in the last example. So in this case, the cell has these protein channels, which you've seen a couple of times in diagrams of the cell membrane, and then also in the bubble investigation when you saw the string make a hole in the membrane. So these channels made out of proteins allow the glucose to move in to the cell in this case because our concentration gradient has more glucose on the outside so it's going to move from high to low concentration into the cell once again until it reaches a concentration gradient. The opposite could happen as well. Let's say I'm a plant cell and I've just created a whole bunch of glucose through photosynthesis. So I have a bunch of glucose inside the cell. I need to get it out of the cell and move it to the other parts of the plant that require that glucose. So again, passive transport, facilitated diffusion, is going to want to move those molecules out of the cell from high to low concentration. Glucose is so big though that it needs a channel to move those molecules out. So again, glucose was our example of things that can move out of these protein channels because glucose is a large molecule. Ions is another example because ions have either a positive or negative charge and that makes it tricky for them to get through those phospholipids of the cell membrane as well. So they often have a channel that they run through. The third example of passive transport is called osmosis. And osmosis is a very specific type of passive transport because in this case the molecules that are moving are only water. So water is the only example of the molecule that uses osmosis. And we always need a membrane. Remember that first example of diffusion when I said it could just be chocolate chip cookie smell moving through the air? There was no membrane there. But in the example of osmosis, there has to be a membrane for this to work. However, it's still passive transport because no energy is required and it will always move with the concentration gradient. The concentration gradient that we're looking for in this case though is the concentration of water. So how much water there is on either side of a membrane determines where the water is going to move. Now, in order to understand the examples of this, you have to remember the difference between a solvent and a solute. And this goes back to your ninth grade science class when you talked about solutions. So whenever you have a solution of something, and our example is gonna be like Kool-Aid, It has two parts, the solvent and the solute. The solvent is the part of the Kool-Aid that does the dissolving. And in the case of Kool-Aid, it's the water that's the solvent. And all of these examples of osmosis, it's gonna be the water that's the solvent as well. The thing that's dissolved in the water is the solute so I'm just going to write dissolved. Okay, so that's the thing that is being dissolved. In the case of Kool-Aid, it's the sugar and the dyes and the other things that are in that Kool-Aid powder. Um, in the case of our osmosis examples, it's anything that's dissolved in the water in the cell or outside the cell. So it could be, for example, proteins that are dissolved in the water or, again, glucose that's dissolved in the water. So it's the solid particles that are in your cells and around your cells. Those are considered the solute. All right, with this in mind now, there are three conditions that can exist in an osmotic environment. So three things that can happen with osmosis. So we'll go through those examples. The first example or environment that osmosis can create is called a hypertonic environment. This is when we have a lot of solute 
So there are a lot of those things dissolve, those solids, and we have less water comparatively to those solids. Okay, so if I would make a cell that's hypertonic, so here's my cell, I'm gonna show the solute as a pink X. So I have lots of solute inside. So maybe a lot of proteins or sugars or something dissolved inside and a little bit of solute outside. But since this is a solution, we also have water involved and they are combined proportionally. So if I have a lot of solute inside, that means I'd only have a little bit of water inside, inside as well. This is like really concentrated Kool-Aid if you wanna think about it that way. Lots of sugars and dyes, very little water. On the outside, comparatively, I have more water than I do on the inside. Okay, so this cell is now considered hypertonic. If something is hyper with a lot of energy, that means it's like really high. So high solute, the cell is hypertonic. What's gonna happen with a hypertonic cell? Well, remember with osmosis, water moves from high concentration to low concentration. So where do we have the high concentration of water? Here we have six molecules of water on the outside and only two on the inside. That means that in a hypertonic solution, it's going to attract water. The water is gonna to wanna to move in to begin to even out the amount of water. And I put attracts in quotation marks down here because it's not like a magnet, it's not like it's attracting it, but just the idea that water is gonna to move toward that hypertonic solution. So in this case, let's get our labels right, the cell itself is hypertonic, okay? The outside of the cell is not hypertonic. We'll talk about what that is in a minute. Another way you can show that, instead of showing X's and all of that, is we can show it as concentration in percentage. So I could say the inside of the cell is 60%, um, let's say, glucose. And the outside of the cell is 40% glucose. And we know glucose is a big molecule. It's not gonna move around unless it's got channels to do so. Then if this is 60% glucose, it means the inside is 40% water. And the outside is 60% water. Same idea, we look at our concentrations of water 40% inside, 60% outside, higher concentration outside, so the cell is hypertonic, the water is going to move in. Okay, so once again, a hypertonic cell is low in water, so it's always going to attract that water. The water is going to move toward it to um, actually even it out. We could also have the opposite occur, which is our second example. This is called a hypotonic environment. In this case, our cell is low in solute, so our solute is still the pink X's, and high in water, which means comparatively the outside of the cell is high in solute and low in water. So this is a hypotonic cell. Hypo, the prefix means low, like hypothermia, your uh, blood temperature gets too low, your body temperature. So hypo means low solute. So the inside of the cell is hypotonic. And now we actually have a name for the outside of the cell as well, because I've told you that high solute, which is what's going on the outside, lots of pink X's, is hypertonic. So the outside of this cell is hypertonic, which means if you think back to the last slide, the outside of that cell was hypotonic. So whenever you have this condition, you're always gonna have one part, the inside or the outside of the cell, be hypotonic, and the other be hypertonic, because it's a comparison. Now, let's look what happens to the water when we have a hypotonic cell.
high concentration of water molecules inside the cell, low concentration outside the cell. So what's going to happen? High to low concentration with the concentration gradient, just like all other passive transport, so the water is going to move out. So again, you can think of this as losing water. You could have the same thing happen and water could move into the cell and we should look at that real quickly as well. I'm going to do this one with percentages just to remind you that it can happen this way. If I have 20% um, glucose inside my cell and 80% glucose outside my cell, that means I have water in a higher amount inside than outside. Okay, and the same as the other example with the X's, high water on the inside, low water on the outside, the water is going to move out of the cell. Okay, that's a hypotonic cell. All right, our last condition for osmosis is going to be on the next slide. And this is an environment that's called isotonic. This is kind of like equilibrium. So it's the same idea in that we have an even amount of solute and water inside and outside of the cell. So if I were to diagram this one, and I'm just going to do this in percentages for you the first time, we're going to say there's 50% glucose inside the cell and 50% glucose outside the cell. And then our water would be 50% water inside the cell and 50% water outside the cell. Now our water, which is what we're looking at for movement, is exactly the same. So we're not going to have a whole bunch of water move into the cell or a whole bunch of water move out of the cell. The water is balanced. It's even or equal. So the water may move in and out, back and forth, but it's pretty much going to stay at this 50-50 ratio. Okay, remember the molecules are bouncing around. They're moving anyway, but there's no reason why we're going to get a whole bunch of water pile up in the cell or a whole bunch of water leave the cell. All right, so those were your three examples for osmotic conditions. Hypertonic, when the solute is high. Hypotonic, when the solute is low. And isotonic, when the solute is even. We'll do some review of these in class, but make sure that you've got everything diagrammed and defined in your notebook before you end this particular video.